Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, enjoying my Tuesday afternoon here at 2 o'clock. And 2 o'clock on Tuesday means Hawaii, the state of health, which is organized by the State Department of Health of Hawaii, which we enjoy very much. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Janice Okubo, who helps us, and we appreciate her help very much in setting this up. She's from the State Department of Health. Our guest today is Keith Ridley. He's the chief of the Office of Health Care Assurance for the Department of Health, and he's going to help us understand um, about care homes. This is the title of our show is Care Homes in Hawaii, Assuring Standards and Quality. Welcome to the show, Keith. Thank you very much. Nice Appreciate to have it. you here. Thank you. You know, I worry about care homes. I think a lot sure. of people worry about care homes because ultimately they'll find themselves in a care home. Unless you have family around you, right. you know, who can make a care home for you, you're going to have to go to a third-party care home and, right. you know, and submit. And the question is, uh, what are the risks of doing that? And I think there were always risks attached to that, but thank goodness you're around to <laughs> ameliorate those risks and make it a, a workable experience for that last chapter. So uh, t tell me, you know, what is the Office of Healthcare Assurance? Uh, what does it do in terms of licensing and supervision of uh, care homes and related medical facilities? Sure. Well, the Office of Healthcare Assurance is the state agency that's responsible for all the licensing, inspections, uh, for all the healthcare facilities that are in the state. So these are hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, residential care homes, uh, ambulatory surgery centers, dialysis facilities, clinical laboratories. There's a whole host of kinds of healthcare facilities that are required by law to be licensed. And we are the agency that goes out and conducts those inspections in order to ensure that they are in compliance with state law. Do they get a little green uh, thing on the front, on the front window that says "passed"? No, but they get that's a, for restaurants. They get a license. <laughs> <laughs> they we get had a license. show about the restaurants. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so a license enables them to operate. Without a license, can no, that's not correct. operate. That's correct. And on occasion, we do get calls from the public, wondering about the home down the street that seems to have a lot of uh, activity and people coming and going, and yeah. wondering if they're a licensed yeah. home. And so uh, we investigate if we need to. Uh, we look at, the, at our records to determine by the address whether that's a licensed home or not. If it's not a licensed home, we'll go in and we'll conduct an investigation to determine whether they are offering the kinds of services on premises yeah. that would require them to be licensed. And if they are required to be licensed, we inform them of that. And if they don't get a license, they're out of business. That's correct. You know, the thing about it is a lot of people who need mm, facilities like this, care homes, are vulnerable, mm -hmm. may I say, mm -hmm. and they don't know about licensing much, right. and they don't know if they're getting ripped off or they're getting substandard care, so you are protecting them from their own lack of sophistication, I think. And whether it's the individual themselves who is the client looking for care for themselves or whether it's a family member. Uh, perhaps a son or a daughter looking for their elder uh, parent or grandparent. Um, there is a lot to navigate in the healthcare field anyway. Yes. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, regardless of whether you're self-pay or where the services are being paid by a government or private insurance, that everyone uh, who is licensed are meeting at least the minimum standards that are required for licensure. So when you go uh, out for a license inspection, I say a care home. We're going to mm -hmm. focus on care homes. Yeah? Um, what are you looking for? What are you, you know, what are the metrics for approving or disapproving a request for a license? Sure. Let's let's back up a little bit and talk about the the definition of a care home, please, uh, because we want to make sure that the audience is aware of what we're referring to. There are uh, a number of the facilities, as I mentioned, that we do conduct licensing on. Hospitals, for example, is acute care. They're an institution. Skilled nursing facilities is an institution. And people sometimes refer to them as a care home. You know, it used to be that they referred to them as the old folks' home, uh, but they'll, they'll sometimes refer to them as a care home. And we also have what we call adult residential care homes. These are arches. These are homes that are literally homes. They're non-institutional in nature. They're the house down the street. Um, and so these are uh, oftentimes the kinds of facilities that we refer to when we talk about care homes. It's like a foster a foster home sort of 
Well, there's even, there's even there's even some sub-definitions that we could get into okay, as well. Okay. But yes, that would certainly be one kind of a care home that fits into that broader uh, term of care home. Mm -hmm. um, so we have care homes that uh, do a, a variety of services. You mentioned the foster home. The adult foster homes are the kinds of homes, for example, that are that were created to help our Department of Human Services and our Medicaid uh, department to provide better uh, or, or uh, have more available beds for nursing level residents, not in an institution, but in someone's home. So they're receiving care in a home-like environment. They're receiving care typically at costs much less than what it would be in an institution. So Medicaid saves some money as well. Uh, and they get quality care. There are other kinds of care homes called these adult residential care homes, the arches as we refer to them, um, that provide similar kinds of care, but they weren't established by the Medicaid department or the Department of Human Services. And they're open to anyone as long as they're licensed, of course, uh, whether they be private pay uh, or uh, if the operator uh, wants to have a contract with Medicaid, they can to provide care for the Medicaid population as well. But typically, these are private pay kinds of homes and facilities uh, for private pay client. Okay, so that's what we're talking about, at right. least for a moment anyway. Right. So uh, when you are evaluating a private pay care home um, of, the, of the kind we just defined, what kind of licensure or um, skills do you need for the individuals who own, operate, staff that home. Right. Uh, typically, we have uh, uh, a nurse aide or a person who has been trained in nurse aide services, and they've got to demonstrate uh, those uh, that educational background to us. They've got to demonstrate to us a uh, experiential background as well. Uh, so typically, we have individuals who are nurse aides or, or who are aides of some sort in a skilled nursing facility, and now they decide they, what they would like to do is to open up their own home uh, and provide care. So there are requirements for the qualifications, and these are all uh, items that are listed out in our regulations uh, that we look for when someone is applying for a license as an adult residential care home or as a community care foster home. Um, and so those are some of the qualifications that we would look for. Well, if let's, let's have a case study here. Okay. Suppose I have a big home, it's a regular house, a lot of little rooms in it, <clears throat> and it dawns on me that I can make a few bucks if I convert this into a licensed care home. Right. Okay. First, the first question I would I would be concerned about, I think, is, is it in the right configuration, and physically? You know, do I have the necessary, for example, number of bathrooms per? Um, you know, per bedroom. Right. I mean, you also look at it to see whether it meets you know, minimum physical specifications as a, a structure? Yes. Oh, yes. The, okay. the regulations are, are fairly extensive. Uh, and we look at not only, again, I mentioned the qualifications of the caregiver, but we also look at what we call the physical plant. Uh, how is the physical plant um, uh, configured? One, uh, are they, do they meet city and county code. So that's a, that's a major requirement. They it have should to be, be easy, but have, you know, sometimes I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we require them before they're even licensed the first time, initially, uh, that they've got to provide us with these documents. Mm -hmm. um, and so they provide us with the county, uh, co uh, county um, clearance uh, that they meet uh, the code uh, and also a certificate of occupancy. Sure. Uh, that, they're, that the home is uh, habitable. Uh, so that's part of what we look for when we look at the physical plan. But we also do look at uh, the size of the bedrooms, how many clients uh, does the operator intend to put in each bedroom, and there are minimum square footage uh, to have more than one. We also look at things like the cleanliness of the home. We, 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 we talk about noise, uh, ambient noise. Um, whether the person would be able to get any rest, for example. Um, and we even look at the size of the windows and the placement of the windows in the rooms to make, to make sure there's adequate natural light, uh, adequate ventilation, uh, and the like. Um, we look at their kitchen, 
We make sure that their kitchen is, is clean and set up appropriately, uh, that they have the ability to store foods uh, appropriately, whether they be dry goods or whether they be cold, uh, cold foods. Uh, and we even go to the extent of making sure that the, uh, the temperature in the refrigerators are accurate. Good. Uh, we want to make sure that cold food is supposed to be stay, stay cold so it doesn't spoil. Um, and hot food that's served is served at an appropriate amount as well, for, at an appropriate temperature. Again, for the notion that people are vulnerable and they won't necessarily be able to look after these issues themselves. Right. So right. you're in loco parentis, you're you know, acting that's, as their protector. That's right. And, and even to the extent, down to the detail of uh, if a food product is opened, for example, they need to label it. When was it opened? When will it expire? So that they know, okay, here's an expiration date that I can't cross. So when it's, uh, when it's up to that date, they've got to toss it out. They can't serve it to the clients. So th this list of requirements suggests that, um, like the restaurants, you have to uh, get up one morning and pay a surprise visit to see if everything is kosher. I mean, isn't that true? Well, it's, it's usually true. Uh, the adult residential care homes by statute um, are required to have two surveys per year. One survey, which is a, the relicensing survey, is scheduled. That's by statute. The second survey is unannounced. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, and even the ones that, is, that are scheduled, um, we don't say we're coming on Thursday, April the 10th, you know, or whatever the date is. We say we're going to come on a Thursday in May. Uh, so there's, there's some allowance, but yeah. there was a concern that uh, oftentimes we'd come go to a home and they'd be out on activities. So no one is there. Yeah. Uh, we can't inspect the home without anyone being there. Yeah. Uh, and so we waste our time, we waste their time, because now we've got to come back, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there was a, uh, uh, that was in mind when the legislature decided that in statute, uh, that's how they would require the licensing visits to be conducted. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, <clears throat> again, in my case study, I have this home, but it sounds like I would probably be better advised if I looked at the regulations before I built the home so I could make sure, or, or looked at it before I dedicated the home because maybe it requires some remodeling reorganization of the walls, the floors, the side, windows, what have you. Uh, because uh, it must be, at least in a certain percentage of the cases, where if somebody makes that decision, like in my case study, right. they're going to have to make some changes to qualify them. Right, right. And it's not that easy to set up a home as a, as a care home. Um, and we often get a lot of calls from people who are interested in opening up a care home. And the first thing we do is we refer them to the regulations read the regulations so you know what you're getting into, what will be required of you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. You know, we'll share with you whatever we can. We'll answer all your questions. Mm -hmm. Because we want you to be informed as a potential licensee of what it is that you'll be committing yourself to. Um, when you receive a, 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 a patient, it's not a matter of, you know, you, you can treat them for a week or so and then they're off. These are people that you're expecting that are going to live with you, potentially, until they pass. Right. So it's, this, it's this forever. Could be, for this could be long term. Yeah. Right. Now that's uh, Keith Ridley. He's the chief of the Office of Healthcare Assurance for the Hawaii State Department of Health, and uh, we're talking today about um, uh, care homes in Hawaii, assuring standards and quality uh, here on Hawaii State of Health. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm telling you, we'll be right back. You'll see. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversations. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be, but I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on Think Tech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month, depends when we're busy, we get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about healthcare, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. This is Alice Lee Hagan. 
host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on a given Tuesday. It's in the 2 o'clock block. And, it's, of course, the show is Hawaii, uh, the state of health. And we're talking with Keith Ridley, chief of the Office of Healthcare Assurance for the Department of Health. And one of his uh, areas is care homes. <clears throat> so our topic today is care homes in Hawaii, assuring standards and quality, which is so important for our kapuna. Um, and I, you know, I, I wonder about that. If you go and you, you go and you find that there's some mm, failure to meet a standard, in some way on one of a surprise inspection or any inspection, um, what happens? Um, uh, how do you handle that? Because you have a lot of working parts in that home. Right. You can't just lock the door. It doesn't work that way. What right. do you do? Right, right. Uh, and we encounter that all the time, and that's a major reason why we go out and we do these inspections. Uh, and whether it's a home that's being licensed for the first time or being relicensed, they all have to follow the same regulations. They have to comply with the licensing requirements. If they don't comply with the licensing requirements, they don't get a license. And if they it's don't get a license, they have to disband the operator. That's correct. And in fact, uh, if they're applying for an initial license, the very beginning license, they can't even have any patients or residents, as we call them, uh, until they are licensed. So thankfully, no one gets kicked out of the home or has to be moved to right, another location right. or not. They right, have sure. to have a license before they can treat you know, resident number one. But once they do have their license and they do have residence and they're providing care, uh, we go in and we conduct regular inspections of their home to make sure that they're keeping up uh, with, in compliance with the regulations. And if we find that they are not keeping up with any particular uh, requirement or set of requirements, we write what we call a deficiency. And we, we provide them with a report that identifies what all the deficiencies are. And we require from them a plan of correction how are you going to fix these deficiencies? And they have to fix those deficiencies to our satisfaction before they will be relicensed. What, what about the patients, clients who are there at the time? They, they can remain there. If we were to find something that is so egregious and life-threatening, then we would take immediate action. And we, and we would make sure that the client, first of all, is taken care of. We wouldn't be so concerned about closing the home or you know, dealing with the, with the, uh, the operator. We want to make sure that the clientele is safe. You tell the operator then you, you got to do this right away, like today. Right. This is right. this is a, a right. real jeopardy point. We're, we're not going to let you wait till tomorrow. That's right. That's right. Uh, and so, and to the extent though, where we can require that the client be moved, uh, and we'll often, if it's something is so egregious, it may also fall under the purview of the Adult Protective Services group under the Department of Human Services. Who would do the moving. And, and they may come in, they may assess the situation in conjunction with us to determine was there harm, was there, you know, was, was there negligence or what have you. Uh, and we would work with them on that. Uh, and then they would help us to move uh, the resident. Fair enough. Well, I mean, has this, I, I guess, inherent in your comment is this happens. Once in a while, this happens. It does. And unfortunately, um, you know, even one time is too many. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but thankfully uh, it doesn't happen very often at all uh, and we're very thankful about that uh, but it does happen and sure. so these those would be the steps that we would take uh, to ensure uh, the patient safety Hawaii has Hawaii has a lot of um, care homes I mean I know as a cultural point because if you reel back a couple of generations you find that everybody was doing you know multiple generations on right. their in their home and all that right. to some extent ohana housing is developed for that purpose but within the family right. and i mean i remember meeting people in my wife's family who 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 lived by virtue of that kind of arrangement and right. they were quite elderly and uh, somebody took care of them that way and it was very informal of course years ago uh, now it's got to be more formal because we can't afford to. But, you know, the point is, there's, there's, it's a whole subculture, isn't it? It's part of the culture of Hawaii that we take care of our kupuna and that we do this informally in somebody's home. So that my guess would be that there are more of these kinds of care homes here in Hawaii 
per capita than in other states. Am I right about that? Well, I wouldn't know about a per capita comparison, uh, but anecdotally, uh, I suspect you're right, uh, that we see a lot more institutional kind of care in other states than we do here in Hawaii. And, you know, the entire continuum of care from hospitals who are providing the acute care services to when the patient gets discharged to perhaps a skilled nursing facility for uh, follow-up kinds of therapy, uh, say, um, following uh, a, uh, a surgery to repair a broken hip, okay? and the skilled nursing facility would help facilitate that kind of physical therapy to get the patient back on their feet. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't happen, there could be other kinds of care that's provided as well. Perhaps the patient's not at a skilled nursing care level. They could be at home. We also have home, uh, home health services where a home health agency goes in uh, and can do physical aging therapy. Up, aging in place. Right, thing. right. And, then, and this is where the patient or the resident or the client is in their own home. Uh, but there would also be situations that you're really referring to, the care homes, where you're in someone else's home. And so this would yet be another uh, uh, facility or uh, caregiver in the continuum of care that we license and that we have the overall responsibility mm -hmm. for. But when you, when you look at these homes, do you, do you check, um, you know, I mean, I don't know if they are required to keep medical records or records of, mm, you know, complaints and symptoms that are observed, that kind of thing. Do you, is there a record keeping like that? And do you look at that to be sure that the, the elders are getting appropriate um, observation and medical care? Yes, that's one of the many things we look at and is the whole point of being able to document the quality of care that's being provided. And it starts off with an assessment of the patient. So usually it would be a physician who would say, you know, I think you could benefit from this kind of care. Perhaps someone no longer has family and they can't care for themselves in their own home. Uh, and so they may be better off living with someone in a, in a care home model. So the physician would typically say, well, here are the kinds of things that you're going to need care for. Uh, you're going to need to have a special diet because perhaps you're diabetic or you have some other kind of condition. Uh, and you should get some regular uh, exercise. It doesn't have to be formal physical therapy, but something that, that will walk help you keep the active. Block, walk you know. around the block, yeah. activities to keep the mind functioning, yeah. etc. Yeah. Uh, and so when the, when the person is now admitted into the care home, there is an assessment done. You know, how is the patient generally in their health? Yeah. Do they have any pressure ulcers or bed sores that they're coming into the home with that need to be taken care of right away? Yeah. Are there any other medical kinds of conditions that have to be um, uh, followed up on? It's almost like a prescription. The doctor is prescribing how they will be handled. In a very good way, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it starts with that assessment, uh, and that has to be documented. What kind of care does the, uh, does the patient need? Yeah. Uh, and then following that, what kind of care was, re was provided and what was given? And so there is documentation with a medical record uh, that has to be kept by the uh, licensee so that when we go in and do a licensing inspection, we can determine that the client or the resident is getting good quality care. You know, one of the, you spoke about activities, walking around the block and all that, and certainly, the, you know, that should go for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you're elderly, it's really important that you keep moving because if you don't move around, bad things happen to you. Right. Um, so, but... You know, uh, what about the risk of a care home that just puts the television on and they sit in a couch and they are hypnotized by the television and the days and hours, sunrise, sunset, all it is is the television. It's so easy to fall into that. Right. How can you prevent against that? How can you make sure that there are some kind of activities to keep their minds and bodies active? Right. And this is where the documentation comes in. Yeah. where they've got to demonstrate to us the kinds of activities they have in the home, uh, and it's not just sitting in front of the television, as you say. Um, uh, does the client have access to a computer, for example? So they might be able to get on there and Google whatever, of, of, you know, whatever might be of interest. Uh, but there are activities that the care home operator uh, takes them on outside the home or even immediately around the home. Go visit a neighbor perhaps work out in the garden, you know, different kinds of things that might be therapeutic for the person to get out of the four walls uh, of the home. 
Uh, so we often see that care home operators will take their residents to movies uh, or take them to the mall and walk around the mall uh, or go to other kinds of, of activities, go to a, a senior um, community association kind of a, uh, of a function that might be at the neighborhood uh, senior center. So these are the kinds of activities that, uh, that we ask the care home operator to demonstrate to us that they will involve their clients uh, in. And they would keep a, a record of having they would, taken them, for example, out that's correct. with this kind of activity. That's like correct, it. right. Yeah, something that's really, really critical. Um, I wonder, you know, um, looking at it again as a case study, so I decide in my, in my wisdom, I decide that I want to run a care home. So I, I get a home, I look at the regulations, I modify it to meet the regulations. I have no, no patients in there now. I get connected with staff and the doctor and what have you that I need to operate. Um, I have you come over and inspect all this and look at my, my plan, so to speak. Um, I go ahead, I, I guess I advertise uh, for people who need care home facilities, and I fill the place up <clears throat> and I'm operating. Uh, am I going to make money or is this a loser? <laughs> <laughs> and what does it depend on? Um, well, in many of our care homes, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, they are private pay. Uh, there are the foster homes, which are Medicaid uh, run, and they probably operate on a slightly thinner margin than perhaps the adult residential care Interesting. homes. Interesting. So the adult resi residential care homes are mostly private pay, and we strongly encourage any client, and in fact we encourage the, uh, the licensee as well, to have a contract with their resident identifying what services are going to be provided, what the cost of the services are going to be, when payment might be due. Okay? We don't regulate the, the cost of that at all. We don't regulate how much is paid. The operator determines that on their own based on presumably uh, market forces and whatever the price might bear. Um, and so they would come into an agreement with the resident or potential resident for living in, say, my home, with these services being provided, these meals being provided, et cetera, these activities uh, for a fee, and this is the fee. So when we go back to what the definition of a care home is, it's caring for an individual <clears throat> where services are provided in, in somebody else's home, not their own home, not related to the caregiver for a fee. All of those things constitutes uh, the requirement for a home to be licensed. Um, because if I'm living with a relative, or if I'm living for, you know, if I'm being cared for for free, that home is not required to be licensed. Yeah. Okay. So, or, uh, so uh, yeah, the contract sounds like an interesting idea because it is the definition of what you get and how much you pay. Right. And I just wondered, uh, and certainly it would be advisable for both sides of that equation to have the contract. That's right. Uh, and, of course, if you go down there, would you want to look at that contract? Yes, you would. Yes. You'd want to see that what was in the contract is what is actually being provided. Right. Again, in loco parentis. Right. Um, but now, well, a contract isn't, but I wanted just to, to be clear, a contract isn't required. Well, I understand. But it is, it is strongly encouraged. Yes. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, and, and, it, it can and help to resolve a lot of the... Yes. A lot of issues, right? You avoid the issues before. But suppose now I have to pay, and I, I guess I'd ask you, what is the range of cost here? Uh, forget about insurance for a minute. It's just what is the range of cost I would expect to pay? And suppose I, I couldn't or didn't or wouldn't, or my trustee wouldn't or didn't or couldn't, and here I am, you know, I'm not paying you. Uh, I mean, I'm a patient who is in, del in delinquency. Uh, what what can the care home, care home owner do? Do you get involved in that? Suppose I, as the care home owner, I say I can't I can't do this. I can't pro continue to provide services for a non-paying client. I, I like you very much, but you can't stay here. Uh, what do I do? Put them on the street? What do I do? We don't regulate um, the cost of care or the ability of someone to pay. Uh, that is something between the care home operator uh, and the resident or the client. Uh, however, when those situations come up, and thankfully they are few and far between, uh, both the care home operator has rights and the patient has rights as well. 
uh, one of the things that we expect of the care home operator is to advise the client of their rights. Uh, and that's why a contract is highly encouraged as well. Um, so that the, the contract might say, if you don't pay, perhaps like any renter's agreement, if you don't pay within a certain amount of time, you know, a fee that is required, then the care home operator has the ability to take steps to begin to essentially evict you. Okay. So there, there are those things that are involved. And where we would get involved is, uh, was the resident made aware of their rights? Was the, were the rights followed? Uh, were the processes that perhaps they agreed to followed? That's another we don't, good reason we don't to have a contract. Exactly. Now, we don't establish those processes, but the two of them agreed to, to that process and agreed to that, to that criteria. So if one of them breaches that, it's an issue that uh, needs to be resolved between them. But there are rights uh, that both but parties have. you would get have. involved in that, you would say this. We want to be sure this is fair. And if you guys have an agreement, we want to be sure that you're fairly executing the agreement. Yeah. Correct. Uh, just one, before we go to the next break, I just want to ask you one. What is the range these days? I mean, this is a hard one. I never promised you a rose garden, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is the range Sound of like expense? my employer. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I would guess it's not cheap, but what is it? You know, it, it, it's a great question, and I, I wish I had a good answer for you, <laughs> okay. unfortunately. Uh, but again, it's, uh, we don't regulate those costs, uh, so we don't really keep track of what they are. I've heard uh, that, they have, that they have ranged from uh, low thousand dollars, couple thousand dollars a month, to upward of three, four, five thousand dollars a month, depending on home, perhaps location, the, the kind of care that's required, uh, et cetera. So what's important to understand uh, on what can help drive that range is that not all clients are alike. Uh, there are clients that require more care. And the others. price can be different for those And clients. the price can be different. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's take a short break. We'll come back and explore that, how interesting, and this affects us all really indirectly or directly. Uh, that, that's Keith uh, Ridley. He's the chief of the Office of Healthcare Assurance for the Department of Health of the State of Hawaii. We're talking, here we are on Hawaii, the State of Health, uh, which is uh, Tuesdays, the two to three block. And um, we're talking about care homes in Hawaii, a very important subject. We'll be right back. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do and that's what I'm here to do on this show. That's Center Stage. It's on every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock. I hope to see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Keith Ridley, the Chief of the Office of Healthcare Assurance for the Department of Health. And we're talking about care homes in Hawaii, a very important subject, really. So, uh, Keith, as, as we left it, we were talking about, you know, what it might cost to be in one of these care homes. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to ask you, what, you know, the, and you said there were various levels of cost, but, but certainly the condition of the patient uh, or, or I guess the, the resident, as it were, uh, has to be relevant. And if the resident is, uh, is out of control in some way or requires greater care or attention or even restraint, that changes the paradigm. Uh, what happens? Because as people get older, maybe sometimes they go Alzheimer, and, and then they become a problem for the other patients in the home. Right. And some, somebody has to do something. How does that work? Right, right. And it happens a lot. Uh, patients age. We, we look at the homes as being somewhere where patients will uh, remain for an extended period of time. 
uh, and they do age, uh, and other medical conditions uh, come up as well. Uh, so typically when we talk about the, the range of the costs, uh, it, can, it is often driven by what services need to be provided and what services the caregiver, who, is, who may be the licensee, is capable of providing. So typically the- and you'll know, you'll know, you'll have, you'll have a file on that. You'll know what, what, cap what services that care home is capable of providing. That's correct, okay. right. And, and even to the degree of identifying whether that care home physical plant is able to care for wheelchair bound patients whether the hallways are, are wide enough, for example, right, right. whether there's a, an ingress and egress to the home right. in case of an emergency. And if it cannot, then we have to find some other solution. If, if it cannot, then what we require of that home, for example, who may have uh, steps going in and out of the home, that they can't have any wheelchair patients. They have to have patients that are ambulatory. Yeah. They have to be able to walk, they have to be able to exit yeah. on their own in case there were a fire or what have you. Does the ADA apply, that kind of thing? Uh, not, not really. Because it's a home. Not really. Yeah. yeah that's okay. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But in terms of the of the kinds of care that's provided, so someone who is on um, the 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 end that's lesser care, uh, someone may be relatively independent, uh, who may just need some reminders about taking medication. Care home operator doesn't give the medications, but just reminds them, oh, Mr. Ridley, it's time to take your medications or, or whatever it might be. Um, and perhaps uh, the resident may also need uh, assistance in the activities of daily living, as we call them, the ADLs. These activities may be getting in and out of bed, toileting, showering and bathing, grooming, those sorts of things that uh, perhaps the, pre the, the, the resident is no longer able to toilet themselves because they can't get out of bed themselves. They've got to be helped. They can't sit. Uh, uh, so this requires and, extra staff, and it extra needs, time. It needs help. Yeah. And typically in a care home, the, the licensee is the operator of the home and typically they are the caregiver. And so these individuals work 24 hours a day, literally, caring for individuals. So it's not like they have some huge staff that come in on the day shift. But it doesn't have to be that, right? I can go higher if I'm, yes. in my case study here, if I if I want to do a care home, I can hire people to do this. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Or, or as we have, we have uh, licensees who own multiple homes. They can't live in all of them, of course. Right, right, right. You know, so they will hire people who will live in the home and care for them. And you have residents. to be satisfied there's sufficient staff in each home. We have to be satisfied that there is sufficient staff, and we have to be satisfied that they meet the qualifications of a caregiver. Right, okay. To the same extent that the initial licensee would be required as well. And so individuals who are now being cared for in the home, these residents, uh, they can have a, a range of care needs from the simple activities of daily living kinds of assistance to now they need help with more than that. Uh, they need help with physical therapy perhaps. So the activities now perhaps become a more uh, integral part of the care that's being provided. Uh, and there may be uh, multiple uh, issues that the patient has. Perhaps they have to go to the, the physician to see their doctor more often. Care home operator typically will take them uh, to, their, uh, to their doctor's appointments with them. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have to be managed. There can be a time when all of those different care modalities or care requirements become too much where that resident really no longer qualifies to stay in the home. What they'll, happens? They'll need to go to a skilled nursing facility. Who makes that hospital. decision? Is it, is it the care home operator? Is it the doctor? Is it the patient? Is it the Department of Health? Who, who makes that decision? The Department of Health doesn't do that, but rather what happens is that when, these, when, the, when the care needs become uh, to the, get to that stage, there's usually a decision between the resident themselves and their physician perhaps a resident family member who may be uh, caring uh, for the elder uh, parent or grandparent uh, and the care home operator as well. Uh, so they will agree on what services need to be provided. So if there is an issue, for example, where there are behavioral kinds of problems that the, the resident has now aged into, uh, dementia, wandering, uh, inability to, to really control uh, the resident, we highly discourage um, anything, any kind of a, a situation that confines the patient 
or the resident. Restraint, physical restraint. Any kind of a physical restraint. We, we, even, do not not allow, <laughs> we even do not allow chemical restraints. You know, the physical restraint is they're tied to the bed. Yeah. Right? We don't allow those things. How about a chemical, chemical restraint is where they're just Strums. drugged and, and, and stuck in the bed. That happens. We don't allow, we don't don't allow that either. No, we don't allow those kinds of things. So there are, un until it gets to the point where there are no other options, and usually by that time, this client or this resident is no longer in these kinds of homes. They're in a skilled it's nursing facility. They moved off facility. to some other kind they of facility. They may be in a hospital as where well. Where there is restraint. Where, where, there, where there are better abilities to treat the patient based on their care needs. Okay. So, and you see this happen too. I mean, as we get older, we see maybe that. lose it. We you know, see we're that. not able to operate within the, the, you know, the traditional confines of a traditional care home. Right. We have to move to some other kind of facility. Right, right. And one of the things, speaking of the, the, uh, the chemical restraints, uh, one of the things that in us working with Medicare, and Medicare has been very concerned about the use of chemical restraints in skilled nursing facilities, for example, is that Medicare has, uh, has required state agencies such as us, um, and besides doing the licensing uh, of these facilities, we also have a contract with Medicare where we do their inspections on their behalf as well. They also inspect through and They you. also expect through us as well. Mm -hmm. And so we'll go into these skilled nursing facilities and we'll look at the kinds of, of uh, activities they have for uh, patients, the kinds of restraints, if any, uh, that are being provided. And only if it's absolutely necessary would uh, those kinds of chemical restraints, restraints be allowed. I'm, I'm happy to report to you and to your viewers that Hawaii has the lowest amount of usage of antipsychotic medication, which is typically the kind of medication you would give to a client yeah. as a chemical restraint. Yeah. We have the lowest use of antipsychotic medication of residents compared to any other state in the country. So, I mean, and we're very proud of that. It should and, be, I mean, because otherwise you have the risk, this, this 19th century risk of just doping someone up and putting him in the corner and right. uh, watching him waste away. Right. So it's better not to do that, right. for sure. Uh, let me, the two other points I wanted to cover, and one is, uh, you know, I told you in one of the breaks that uh, for a lot of people it's hard to find a facility. Is, is there anything being done or can be done to increase the number, to incentivize the number of facilities in Hawaii so that everybody would have an easy time of it, in, you know, getting placed in a care home? Well, um you know, the numbers of facilities is just part of the equation on whether there are an adequate number or adequacy uh, of supply to meet the demand. And we know that there will be a growing demand because of the increased uh, aging population. Because it is a free market. Right. In other words, if I have if I have a thousand people knocking at my door, I'll raise my rates and that'll take care of it. That, that would be one way. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, obviously the good part of that is that others who might be thinking about getting into that kind of business see the market opportunities from a, an income standpoint uh, and they would see that and so that's one of the reasons why you know we don't look at uh, at rates and regulate rates you know we want to make sure that the clients are safe regardless of how much they're paying yeah. and so we focus sure. in on the quality of care and the physical plan and all of those kinds of things that are what about, currently what about um, Medicare Medicaid are they, do they look at rates Oh, they only reimburse to a certain extent. They'll right? reimburse at a certain amount. So if I raise my rates to some astronomical level, um, I may or may not get paid. Well, you'll get paid, but you'll get paid at the government level. And so your, your public charge, let's say, might be $5,000 for the month. If Medicaid is only going to pay you $1,500 a month, you can't pass on that difference to the, to the client. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the so the operating margin for those kinds of homes, these are the adult foster homes. Yeah. You know, maybe a bit thinner as a result. Just uh, as you said than, initially. Than as the private pay. <laughs> That's Keith Ridley, and I, I wish he can come back. I'd like him to come back. There are I'll more questions to. here. Uh, Chief of the Office of Healthcare Assurance for the from the Depart for the Department of Health here on Hawaii, the State of Health, on Tuesdays at uh, two to three. I'm Jay Fidel. We've been talking about care homes in Hawaii, and we have mm, much more to go. So we'll have another show on this discussion. Terrific. Thank you so much, Keith. You're very welcome. Aloha. Aloha.